God and Other Delicacies has a weekly newsletter. If you'd like to subscribe, email me at godsdelicateshow at gmail.com and I'll put you on the list. Hello, everyone. Welcome to God and Other Delicacies. I'm Nicholas D'Augusto. Thank you all for being here. Today, I have the privilege of welcoming Ken Haynes to the show. Ken is a television writer and executive producer. He has worked on a number of series, including Midnight Texas, Rizzoli and Isles, and Make It or Break It, among others. He also currently sits as a board of directors trustee at the WGA, the Writers Guild of America. I met Ken when he and his late wife, Mary, wrote and created the pilot Eden and cast me as their lead alongside our good buddy, Enver Jokai. We unfortunately didn't get to take it to series, but we did get to freeze our asses off in Times Square, <laughs> throw punches at each other in Chinatown, and pull an all-nighter in an empty Madison Square Garden. Do they give sequels to TV that no one's ever seen? I sure hope so, because that's the reason I brought him here. Welcome to the show, Ken! Hello, Nick. <laughs> Hi, Ken. How you doing, buddy? I'm very well, thanks. We were just talking right before I uh, started that you were reminding me that you did a show with Billy Ray Cyrus and... You were telling me that you cast Miley Cyrus in her first role? How old yes. was she? You know, I was like trying two? to... F <laughs> she wasn't that young. I mean, so it would have been in the early 2000s, so probably around 2003 or four, I'm guessing. Um, so she must have been eight or nine. Wow. Um, we did a show. We did four seasons with her father. He played a country doctor, and there was a small... There was a young boy on the show sort of his pseudo son and um we cast miley as this really cute you know eight-year-old love interest um and so it was it was really fun and i loved her she was she was terrific and um i'll tell you one quick story sure about give me an I, anecdote that i just thought of actually um when i was directing she would ask if she could sit next to me in the chair. And of course, she's the daughter of the star. She wasn't Miley Cyrus' superstar. She was the daughter of Billy Ray Cyrus. Sure, so sure. of course you can sit next to me, Miley. And she, I remember her telling me, I don't know what I want to do, but maybe I want to be an actress. Maybe I want to be a director. Wow. I said, okay, sure. And then after a little while sitting next to me, she would say, um, Ken, could I, could, could I say action? I said, sure, you can say action. I'll point to you. So we'd get ready to go. I'd point to her, and she would, in a booming voice, yell, action. Wow. Then she said, can I say cut? I said, sure, I'll point to you, cut. And then I remember we had a scene where it, 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 it can, was... Can I set up this shot? I feel like you're not quite getting the right angle on this. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Just like, all of a sudden she's setting up. Sorry, go on, go on. She, as we were moving to a scene, a comedic scene, it was just, everything was sort of stiff. And I said, Miley, I got an idea. I want you to go in there and tell your dad to loosen up. Let's have some fun. And she goes, oh, I know how to do that. And this little eight or nine-year-old walked into the middle of that set, you know, with 25 crew members around, sort of planted her feet and said, hey, dad, let's shake it up. Let's have some fun in this place. Everybody started laughing. Wow. I signaled her. She came running back. I pointed at her. She said, action. And we had this very loose, fun scene. So wow. that was my one of my really early memories of Miley, which is really lovely. And I know her to this day. I think she's just an absolutely lovely person and she's a neighbor and she's a great neighbor so wow and yeah. and it's so clear that you could see the talent and the intelligence at that age yeah yes and like the fearlessness all of those things but what was the most memorable to me was that she had a kind of drive that i've never seen in a young person mm. and i'm sure it's from having grown up watching her father perform. I don't think she knew exactly what she was going to do, but she was going to do something. And you knew as, again, however old she was, you knew as an eight-year-old, whatever that was, that girl was going to do it. Yeah. And obviously she has. You yeah, know, yeah, so. that's extraordinary. Yeah, so That's was, a cool story. It was fun. It was fun. Um, okay, man, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I forgot that that was a question. Well... What did I have? I had what has become kind of my traditional weird breakfast. 
I had. I can't l- wait to hear. Watermelon. Oh. Rice crackers. Oh, you healthy son of a bitch. Yeah, some goat cheese. <laughs> oh, that's Two nice. kinds of goat cheese. Really? Two different kinds of goat cheese. Some raw walnuts, a couple of uh This is Brazil why you look nuts. so good. You're like and glowing, and I'm wondering, why is he glowing? He looks great. What, uh, He's sleeping else. well. Oh, here's not so healthy. Um, a little salami. <laughs> One Snickers bar. <laughs> uh, and a salami, coffee. you said? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's why. Come yeah, on, you got a little, little spice it up and a couple of yeah. olives, so... Very oh, weird breakfast, but it's feels become a kind of European. Feels kind of Mediterranean yeah. in there. Yeah, I got into having olives and meat and, and cheese, and cheese and some, some kind crackers. of good uh, cracker or nutty thing. So that oh, was man. breakfast. Ken watched me shovel a half a <laughs> maybe a third of a breakfast burrito from yesterday cold into my mouth, and then like some cauliflower mashed potatoes and some leftover fake turkey. Uh, it looked delicious. <laughs> it was all very cool out of Tupperware. <laughs> um, all right, man. You know why you're here. How and when were you introduced to the idea of God in your life? Well, I'm going to tell you some things about me that you don't know. I cannot wait to hear. I uh, cannot. I do not know what this means, and I cannot wait to hear. Well, so God, I a priest. grew up... Um, my family were Seventh Day Adventists. We went to church on Saturday. Okay. I oh my God. was. You have to tell me all about this. Yes, I don't, I don't think I've ever told you anything. No, 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 no. Went to church on Saturday. Um, I went to religious schools. Does from, that mean you went on on Saturday and Sunday? No, Saturday. Just Saturday was your our day. Sabbath was from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. Everyone in the neighborhood thought we were Jews. Right. Um, That's the, typically what it, exactly. And we actually even. We essentially ate kosher in terms of the law, the, 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 the biblical laws. You know, we didn't eat uh, shellfish. We didn't eat pork. It, it, essentially the same sort of uh, uh, laws that, that, that govern a kosher diet. Um, I went to private religious schools from the time I was, I went to a public kindergarten. And then from first grade to eighth grade, I went to a, a, a small school called Fir Grove Elementary, a Seventh-day Adventist school. And then I went to two years of private high school. And then in my junior year in high school, I moved on to a larger inner city school because I was an athlete and I wanted to play um, more competitive sports. But um, well, so I was Not inter- to derail from the really interesting thing, what sports were you playing? Basketball. Okay, cool. I'm a huge... I'm still a basketball player. I'm oh, still wow. a basketball fan. I didn't know they used to oh, play. So, it, you, so you like keep a regular game and all that. I have a regular game. Up until recently, I had a couple of games. And I play with writers and some actors every Saturday. Do you um, handle the ball or do you play underneath? I handle the ball. Okay, yes. right on. I mean, really, my youth, my misspent youth was on the basketball court. I, I played basketball every day of my life... And it was just my passion, my obsession. And, wow. um, you know, then then discovered acting, moved on. <laughs> but to get back to your original yeah, question, right. so my parents were religious, and um, I was introduced to organized religion as, you know, by the time I was in first grade. And um, it was a very big part of our life because it was not only schooling, it, it, that religion also had its own sort of social network. So... You did things with people from school, from the church as well. So, well, I completely understand that. I mean, I that was a similar. I mean, look, I w- was raised Catholic, uh, right, and many similarities in the sense of like the sociocultural uh, depth of the inter of the relationships you're creating in the community. It's there's the, you're just that's just all a part of your social fabric. So. How, how many siblings do you have, or do you have siblings? I have I have one younger brother. Okay, yeah. so both of you raised yeah. in this. Yeah. So what are what are the core belief differences in the Seventh Day Adventists versus, say, a a kind of more, uh, like a Lutheran or a Catholic? Um, I, I think it's more in terms of sort of taking the Bible literally. So that's why they believe sundown is on the seventh day and. Um, you know, Saturday. Um, but I would say, other than that, it's it's pretty straightforward Christian religion. You believe in heaven and hell. You believe that uh, Jesus will, you know, died for our sins. That that he will uh, come back. 
the, those that were going to be saved will be resurrected, all of that kind of stuff. Did you ever have a time period where you really loved it? As in your youth or anything? Did you ever really love it? Or well, did you I'll bro- tell you, you know? what I loved. Yeah. I loved the community very much. Um, I embraced the community. I liked the, the people that I was with. I liked the social aspect of it. The religion scared me from a very early age. Wow, how, it, how early do you think you... As started... early as I can remember, wow. I was confused by it. Fire and brimstone. Uh, okay. a, th- a thousand years of burning if you were... You know, if, if you were evil and you weren't, you didn't ascend with Jesus. All that stuff just scared me. I didn't, it, it, I didn't understand it, and I found it frightening. I remember things like when Jesus came back, he was going to start a small cloud in the distance, and it would get bigger and bigger until you realize this was a cloud full of angels, and it was Jesus coming back. So as a young kid, I would look up and see a small cloud and think, oh, my God, is it today? And wow. and I haven't been good enough, and what's going to happen? And, oh, you're going to go to the fiery lake for a thousand years. So it, uh, I would sure. say it really scared me. Um, and then I had my time when it didn't feel like it really related to me. I was interested as I got late in elementary school and into high school. You know, I started being much more interested in basketball and girls and movies and television. I always loved movies and TV. And so it it's not that I went away from it. It just didn't it didn't resonate with me. It didn't have a huge part of me. But I think when you grow up with a former religion like that, those fundamental things on some level are always with you. Mm. They're under the things, even if you're not aware of it, it's, you know, it, you, it, they're, they're under how you think and how you act and that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I've talked about this before, but, um, I, you know, I've had a number of friends that are Jewish come on the show. It's much easier and much kind of just because of Jewish history. So clear that, uh, you, you can be Jewish whether you practice the religion anymore or not. <clears throat> but it's not quite the same. You don't really say, like, I'm still Christ. You know, I'm not Christian even though I don't practice the religion. You know what I'm saying? Right. And at the same time, I do feel culturally Catholic in the way that I think in some ways what you're talking about is that. You know, the, the things that, that lay their foundation in you in such a young age, you can't really entirely uproot um, uh, and they are a part of who you are for your entire life, whether you sort of practice it or, or not. I think you're right. I think that it, regardless what religion we're talking about, I think you can be culturally religious in what you grew up with and have no real emotional or, or spiritual connection to it. I mean, there's something about that that I think forms in us at a, at a young age that we don't escape. Your your philosophical connection to those ideas comes or goes. I mean, it, it depends. You know, I think from my own in my own life, at times those things have been very important to me, and at other times they've sort of gone away. Um, and the older I get, I would have to say they're more important to me. Mm. I think about them more. Maybe I have more time to think about them more. Mm. Maybe I reflect more, or I want something in my life that that is richer in terms of that. That's beautiful. We're not there yet. Okay. (laughs) uh, um, So I want to hear more about, uh, it's really important for me to know how your relationship was with your parents in your youth. So like, were they very, were they bringing this into the home a lot? Were they living it very authentically? Were they a fire and brimstone? Did they pass on some fire and brimstone in the house? No, they did not pass that on. They were religious. They were, you know, we went to church. I went to, we called it Sabbath school, not Sunday school. Mm. Um, we had Christmas time, the church, we went caroling and we raised money and we did our volunteer work and we did all that, but they were never the fire and brimstone kind of people. Um, but they participated in the religion. They believed in the religion they were they were religious, but they were gentler. I think that thing that I'm describing, the thing that that made me afraid, I think was 
twofold. I think it's the way it was presented to a young person. And frankly, I had a real imagination. Mm. I made stuff up, mm. whether it was stories or whatever. As a young kid, the teachers would say to my mother, oh, listen, we have a problem with him. He just stares out the window, lost in thought. I was making up those stories then. And I'm sure that I made up stories about the religion. If you told me a story, I, I somehow embellished it. And I think I probably embellished it. And then as I got older, um, there were things that I did not understand that, and I, I would question. And when I got the answer of, well, you just can't understand that because that's in essence above your pay grade. That's God understands that you can't, that wasn't good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And that was a time when I think sort of my intellect was developing where I probably stepped away from it and thought, well, that's a load of crap. About um, how old are you, do you think, when this is I, happening? I'm probably in my early, mid-teens mm -hmm. kind of time, and I thought... You're well, still I'm, maybe in the original high school? I'm still probably in the original high school. Yeah, and so then it, that, it felt that formal religion did not feel um, satisfying to me. Mm. And then I got into my life, and which was sports and fun and, you know, movies and that kind of thing. Did you, did your parents have any concerns about you not following in the faith, maybe as you were leaving and going to this different high school? And then, would, I mean, it seems like maybe chronologically as well, the chronology of lining up your sports happened to also sort of follow alongside your sort of, um, like your emotional faith Yes. Uh, arc. It, well, it was you sort of split from the family, maybe emotionally, and in the, in the, at least in a faith sense, and then sort of split from the family in that you're like now entering into the city away from the shelter that you'd sort of maybe been raised in. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, it definitely followed that sort of timeline and that trajectory. Um, I mean, because I could have very well graduated from a Seventh day Adventist high school possibly gone to a Seventh-day Adventist college. And Seventh-day Adventists tend to work in the medical profession. They work as teachers. I mean, you can kind of stay, I don't know if isolated is the right word, but but you can kind of stay in that religion and it can be a part of your work and your social, it can be everything. And so, I mean, I could have, I suppose, gone in that direction. I went in another direction. I was very interested in sports. And I was becoming interested in the world. I think I was also becoming interested. I grew up in a small town. I realized I, there was something else out there. Where was the town? I didn't even get this. Where yeah, it was a sm it, it, It's called Vancouver, Washington. Right. Oh, a, so you were up in Vancouver, Washington. Yeah. Okay, right. You know, bedroom Gosh, community. I, I didn't even really get Portland. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, my parents, either out of not indifference, they for some reason, kind of allowed me to make my choices and to fail or succeed on my choices. And so I, they, they empowered me that way. So they never really, they never really, it was never an issue that I was going to a public school. They loved that I played sports. They were big fans. They were into it. Um, and they just sort of, allowed me they didn't impose anything on my life they allowed me to follow you know what i wanted to do which includes years later following my dream into you know the entertainment business for me to be an actor from where i come from i mean it's like saying oh yeah i'm gonna grow two heads hmm. i mean it was just there was no reason to think what did your parents do what did your father my father do? was a salesman and my mother was a secretary. You know, she did all kinds of different things. She ran a dental office. She ran a legal practice. So, you know, she was an office worker. And how small was the town when you were growing up in it? Well, it's funny. I was just asking her that. I just visited her. Oh, your mother's still alive? Yes, yeah, she's oh, wonderful. still alive. Yeah, she's 92. Wow. And, um, your father is gone? My father passed away about six years ago. Okay. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, I think there was somewhere around twenty five or 30,000 people when I was a kid. It has, it has grown. It's so much bigger now. I'm guessing there's a couple hundred thousand people right. in that area now. Um, but it was, a, it felt like a small town. You know, um, there were a couple of high schools, um, 
But yeah, so I, I, for some reason, maybe it was television, maybe it was watching movies, which, you know, I, I love TV and movies. Somehow I got this idea that there was a creative world, there was something out there that was calling me that was not small town USA. And, um, and at a certain point, I made I started studying economics in college hmm. because I didn't really like business, but I had been very entrepreneurial as a kid. I had a bunch of different businesses. Hmm. I'd made very good money as a kid. As an 18-year-old, I got my real estate license and What? Yeah, I I mean and I as a kid I Wow, what a go-getter. I I had Jeez. a I had a gardening business. I had a I little just... construction business. I had a painting business. I sold World book encyclopedias. I sold women's shoes. I sold Christmas. What? I mean, I was very, I was a hustler. And I just did all kinds of things. And frankly, I made enough money in my first year or two in college that I, I was at a little small college in the town I grew up in that I went away to the University of Washington. And I said, I'm going to study acting. And I could afford to do it. I was away. I was, and I started studying it so and i'm sure that my parents believed oh he'll outgrow this and he'll go back to you know i i'm sure they thought i was going to be a, a businessman you know so but they but the point is that they allowed me to take my journey they allowed me to choose my path they never said don't do that they never said you know they i think they were concerned but but they allowed me to go in my direction that is a beautiful place to take our first break. And uh, I cannot wait to dive more into the hustling campaigns <laughs> after the oh, break. Yes. All right, we're back with Ken. And I kind of can't stop giggling about you being this like hustling young <laughs> entrepreneur. I mean, it's so different than the way I was. Uh, I was, oh. I mean, I fell in love with acting at a young age. So that yeah. was very different. I was 11 when I start, when I really became aware that I wanted to be an actor. Oh, you uh, were young. Yeah, yeah, I was. But I, uh, but I wasn't, my father's a businessman, uh, but I didn't have this sort of, I was telling you that a little bit about this outside of the show. I was a, I wanted to do well by others a lot when I was young. And I think an element of being someone that can hustle and has an entrepreneurial spirit like that at such a young age, you caught wind that it was, that you didn't need the, you kind of, that you were the one that was going to do the convincing rather than someone like me, maybe the default was something like, I'm hoping that someone else notices me. You know, it's a little different sort of angle on it. And I guess I'm not sure how you respond to that. Maybe you see some truth in that. I'm not sure. And to be fair, I'm not entirely sure that that's a fair uh, assessment of me as a young man. I mean, part of it is I don't want to talk for 20 minutes about me as a young man. I, mm -hmm. I just sort of want to try to try to give a soundbite about it. But yeah. there's something about having such wherewithal to like start throwing yourself out into the world in all these different ways. Where do you think you got that from? And what do you think is the inspiration for that? I, that I don't know. Now I wanted, I think you were saying the approval or to be noticed by others. I wanted to be noticed by people. I, the people at that point in my life, I wanted to be noticed by were largely men who who were business people that I was working for in some way. I wanted to show them uh, that looked like my way out, so to speak. So the man who owned the real estate company that I went to, he said to me, "Kid, you should you should get your real estate license." Oh yeah, I didn't even know what it was, but I knew he was a real estate broker, and so I turned eighteen, I got my license, hmm. and I started working. But I met him by building a fence for him. I didn't know how to build a fence. Hmm. I knew someone in my neighborhood who said, oh, I can tell you how to build a fence. So I said to him, oh, yeah, I'll build you a fence. And I don't remember, I mean, I don't even remember what I charged him. But whatever it was, it would have been pennies on the dollar compared to had he got a contractor. And I learned how to build a fence. And I impressed him that I 
could hustle and I could follow through and I was responsible. And so I did want to be noticed in that way. And then certainly as you become an actor, yes, yes, you yes. want to be noticed. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so. Wow. And but so I don't know where it comes. I, I'm really, I don't know where that comes from exactly. I have one more question about that, just kind of probing that thought, which is what was money like in your house when you were growing up? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it was an issue in my house. I think we lived a, you know, middle class existence, but I was aware that there were things we couldn't afford. Mm. Um, I was aware that others had more than us. Um, and at the same time, it's not like I was ever hungry. It's not like I didn't. I had most of the things I think that I wanted, but I think my father, um, my father struggled a little bit, you know, trying to make ends meet. And but, but at the same time, I say that I mean, we always had a nice home. He worked for a company for a long time, you know. He had company cars and all that. But I, I was aware that other people had more than we had. And I think I probably was most aware that I think my father wanted that. And I, I saw in him that he didn't have that. Mm. And I think probably where my drive came from was I'm going to have what he doesn't seem to have. Because I think as, as a young person, it's like he values it. He wants it. It must be good. Well, I'm going to get it. And I think maybe that was part of my drive. Yeah, it's um, really interesting. Yeah. It's really fascinating. It makes me, you know, my father is such a powerful force in my life and my family's life. Really just a such a dominating kind of energy and personality. Yeah. Wonderfully charming, beloved person and kind of, he has a kind of classic American, you know, story, worked as a, you know, manager at a fast food joint. And then, the, I remember then this. and then, yeah. And then the guy, like, it's a strange story about this dude who was rich and he spent so much money. He went bankrupt, you know, but he was still rich. The business was running well and they had to sell them, sold them to some of them to my dad. And my dad bought the business and kept going. And so yeah. guy that comes from a very poor background, but then as I come up, you know, he's huge overachiever. So I think in some sense, I think in my family, it was a little different angle on the top patriarch of the family, right? You, you sort of wanted to take your, what your father had done and maybe go farther. And yeah. for me, I think most of my family is like, gonna be hard to beat dad, you know? <laughs> you know, oh, you know, wow. you know like, like in a sense, you know, not that, I don't think that was a driving force for me. My force is just that I had different, very different interests. And so I wanted to break into a new, I wanted to follow my curiosity into new ways that my family didn't have the same structure. But I think most of my brothers and sisters would probably say, you know, my dad is, a, my mother and father together, because I know now more than ever having a wife, how much a partnership is really about both of them, how much a business success is about both. Sure. But, um, you know, they did so much achieving, you know, uh, I it think. It sounds like it. it I mean, it, he's a success story. Yeah. yeah. And so or I they're think, a success Yeah, I think story. that's right. And I think... Uh, and it's an inspirational story. And so that became the family story. And I think what's interesting for you is you saw a different story that you could write that, I mean, not to be so on the point with calling it a writer, but no. I mean, that you could write a new story and take your father's story even further. Well, it's interesting. And it's something that I think about now. Um, I look at what I've done, the success I've had, that I came to Los Angeles, you know, with really nothing, a, a car full of a few books and some clothes and right. a, a few thousand dollars. Your dad didn't have a ton of money to give you? No, no. I And, and I remember when I left, um, they stood in the driveway and I'm sure they thought, oh my God, what is this kid going to do? Um, because again, there, there was really, I, I had no no real right to, to, to think that I could accomplish this. But they gave me something very interesting. I think because of his desire for more, it gave me a great drive. And he gave me, they told me I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm. And at the same time, there was also a lot of fear in my family. My father was afraid of not having enough money, afraid of being out of work, all of that. So they gave me these two things. They said, basically, 
kid, go, you can do anything. Oh, watch out, it's, it's a dangerous world. Those two things, even mm. though they, they work in opposition in a way, fueled a drive in me. So I was scared that I wouldn't fail, and I was determined that I could, I could succeed. So it was a very weird sort of cocktail, so to speak, that fueled me believing that I could do something like have a career in the entertainment business because it's, it's frankly, it's a crazy, crazy dream. And it's especially a crazy dream from where I come from. Right. You know, right. So, but it worked yeah. and somehow, you know, and I'm fortunate. I'm, you know, that it worked. But, That's um, great. Man. And my father was also, um, I didn't know it at the time. Um, he, I think my father had post traumatic stress from World War II. Where did he fight? He went in at Normandy, not in the first wave, but he went in, you know, the next day in those beaches and went right across uh, Europe and was in the Battle of the Bulge and, you know, was in the war wow. till, till the end. And he was a, a medic and um, I heard stories. He was not a guy who didn't ever talk about the war. He talked about the war to us. And there was some really horrific experiences that he experienced as a very young man, 18 years old. He was literally drafted. He was still in high school. He got a deferment for a few weeks to graduate. And within a week of high school, he left his little town in Indiana and was in basic training and shipped off to to Europe then, whatever it was, six, nine weeks after that. My goodness. And so he was later diagnosed with that. And I think that caused him a lot of uh, difficulties as as an adult. Wow. And um, but at the same time, you know, he was a good father. He 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 raised a family. He held a job. You know, so he was a medic. So he, was he medic. wasn't asked. I mean, he still carried a firearm, right? I mean, they did not medic, carry firearms. Oh, they did not. No, okay. and he and he became a medic because of his his and his family's religious beliefs. Wow. They were conscientious. Objectors, oh, but he I couldn't. Guess. But I guess at that stage you couldn't conscientiously object yourself completely out of the. You war. couldn't. So what you did was then being a medic was the next thing. You 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 were never, or theoretically, you were never going to have a gun and be killing people. You you were going to be trying, trying to, to save. save people. Yeah. So so yeah. he goes to boot camp to learn how to be a medic. Yep. Wow. He yeah. gets a crash course in saving a life on yeah. the battlefield. Yeah. And it I was mean, a, the stories are just and so it was, intense, you know, it man. was it was real. It was that real wave that pushed right across Europe, and it was, um, I think, it was frightening. I mean, I think it was a really hellacious experience. I can't for imagine. Him. Yeah, um, I can't imagine. I mean, I'm, I actually I've been to those beaches. I've visited France and been to those beaches, and like when you see them, you're just like. When you, you know, I'm I'm a I have a history degree. I love these stories. I grew up loving these stories, but. When you stand, you know, for so, for so many of us, war is so far away. And with the way it works now, with young people entering the military, and it's just so hard to run into too many, to enough of these stories. You know, I know one or two people maybe that have fought yeah. in some of the recent wars, you know. No, and my generation has sort of missed it. I was, t you know, obviously too young for Vietnam. I was probably, I mean, and there hasn't, I mean, I guess the the fighting in the Middle East, but you know I was too old for that kind of thing. Yeah, so by that point, war the draft was done. Sort of concept. War was movies for me. Yeah, you know, so. it's it's amazing to think about that. And it, obviously, it's like you know we're telling a story about something that's like past. It's not. It's like there's still people that's living right. this now, but we don't have to be drafted, and so we don't live with that fear. That's ourselves. right. That's right. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, my grandfather fought on the uh, Asian side. Um, oh, so, um, so yeah, uh, I, yeah. Just thinking about that. I think it's just very striking. You know, I think that I, I just think it's like, man, we live such a separate existence from these pains in the world. Right. I mean, like these wars that exist, these, the horrible news cycles that come at us, these people are living this today. The world, the, these world wars are not gone. They're still there just not being fought the same way, you know? There are I, people are subjected to this pain and horror all the time. That's right. <clears throat> and we're not and in we're access, not. and we just, and we're losing the generations that did have 
the majority of the generations that were the where the largest percentage of them were the where the where you could tell an, a story about a generation about the war they fought those are all gone now it's just That's it's right. like three percent or something of like the population fights in our wars now right isn't it something super low it's, like that i think it's it's really low and we've never had a war since world war ii where everybody really got behind it yeah. in that yeah. kind of way where kids went down and signed up because you know it's that notion the the greatest generation that that there was a universal calling in this country to to step up and fight. I mean, I don't think that that obviously didn't happen in Vietnam. I don't. Maybe it happened after nine eleven to a certain extent, but um, you know, war to me. I mean, if I'm honest, I know I know of war through my father, having seen his experience. And movies. Mm. That's what, whether it's World War, War II or or Vietnam or, or really any kind of conflict in the Middle East, I know it mostly through movies because I also was someone of enough privilege, even though I'm talking about my parents' struggle, that I didn't have to go in the army. Right. I, I was never in a draft situation. So... Um, it's a sacrifice that I completely respect and probably, if I'm honest, don't completely understand. Yeah, I think I feel the same way. You know? I, and I think there's a part of me that there's a sense of, um, I guess, some regret or something that I don't understand it. Yeah. Because maybe I don't know how to truly appreciate it. Well, I'll tell you one story that has obviously stayed. It's very personal to me and stayed with me. But talking about the effect of war. Please. My father went in, uh, to Europe, World War II, as an 18-year-old. He died when he was, I believe, 86. Mm. He was in a coma briefly. He came out. My brother was there. Um, he spoke to my brother briefly, uh, told him that he loved him, and he basically turned away from my brother and then said out loud, I was never the same after that war. And he closed his eyes and he died. Are you kidding? Me? So that is one of the, maybe the last thing that was rolling around in his mind before he passed away. That tells you how profound that experience was for him. And I think, you know, to men, I think for a lot of people, it's such an incredibly intense experience that it stays with him. And so it stayed with him. Um, I I have chills. I'm frankly like I'm emotional hearing that. That's that's so powerful to hear that. And what's to think interesting that that's your last. That's that's your last thought. And and I think for me, I I understood that he was probably not the same after that war. In, in, in how shall I say, like like an intellectual way, just having known his experience and his struggles emotionally, um, but to have heard that that's what he voiced, I thought, oh wow, it's much more profound than I even realized, you know. Wow. So, can uh, I think I need a break after okay. that? <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll see. Uh, we'll see you all back here after, okay. after the break. All right, everybody, we're back. I've had a chance to recover. Um, it was We were just talking after the break um, or in the break. It's just such an, a powerful story to hear about that. It's impactful. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to go down this road a long way. We talked about, but there's other things I want to talk about. But one thing sure. you mentioned I think that's worth mentioning is that obviously it affected him in his life, his ability to function but it affected it affects the children. Yes, it, this stuff, this trauma passes down through generations. Absolutely, because you you are then left trying to understand the trauma of your father, which is traumatic. And I didn't understand it at all. I mean, until I was much older. But I think it's what's, I think it's part of what's forgotten. Now, I don't want 
to say that what happened to him in any way, uh, how I grew up, was equal to yeah, that experience. Right. You know, it wasn't obviously. Um, but there's a ripple effect. But there is a ripple effect. If it's effect. a ten to him, it's a That's it's right. a five to you. Or it something. affected him in a huge way, and that gets passed down. Yeah. And I don't have children. If I did, I'm sure, good and bad. Some of that would be passed down. I'm sure that in the young people, my godchildren, that I have really close relationships with, I'm sure that what I experienced with him, I have taken that and put my own spin on it, you know, so. Well, Ken, I mean, um, as we said, we could keep talking about this for a long time, but there's another enormous part of our of of obviously your life, but of where I entered into, I was in your life yes. in working with you in a very direct way during this time when, when we did eat in together. So we're just going to kind of fast forward through your Shh. getting started in the business, things yes, I would have sure. loved to have talked about, sure. you know, uh, but, um, I would have told you the stories about how I was a private investigator. Oh my God. Did you, you know? You, you did tell, okay, I remember I was, this now. But, no, I'm only teasing you. Let's talk about it. Mean, I a, remember though right i remember knowing about that at the time and probably having this same response which right. is fit now fits more into the ken i'm getting a feeling of of the entrepreneurial ken yes. the ken who's willing to yes. kind of to be any to wear so many different hats yes you i didn't know that you were one of these guys that could just kind of i didn't know you were such a baller like i didn't know you were such a basketball guy right like you yeah, have a you're lot a of basketball hats. player, aren't you? I, I am a sports guy. I've as I've gotten older, my knees have gotten worse. Oh. So I do. I'm like a big. Uh, now everything goes into Pilates. Oh, I'm a okay. Pilates guy right. because I need to keep my body limber and stuff. <laughs> oh, oh, because oh, I'm yeah. not kidding, man. My hips and knees they oh, get yeah. out of whack so quick. Yeah. But um, you apparently are made of very good stock because if you're still running like a lot of my dudes, we're we can't even hack it anymore. It's harder and harder. Yeah. I'm still doing it. It's painful. Yeah. Okay. Good. You know, <laughs> You're icing I, afterwards. I um, play basketball with guys now that are considerably younger than me. That a few years, maybe it's more than a few. I probably would have dominated. Now I'm just happy to be a part of it. Yeah. All right. You all know. Right, all right. So I, lo <laughs> I love the few. game and I love the camaraderie and I love the 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 physicality of it and all that. So, yeah, man. Anyway. Well, me too. Um, but it still hurts. Yeah. <laughs> so. You, you, you tell me about Mary. How did you meet Mary? And then bring me cut. Do me your best at sort of yeah. like give give me how you met Mary, and and then we'll get to Eden. And you know, I know it's a lot to tell a story like this. You can't make well, it happen I'll, in fifteen minutes, really, the same way that you would tell a story like this. But do your best. I will try to tell it as concisely as possible. So I moved to Los Angeles in the late eighties. Uh, immediately got uh, started in an acting class actually right out here in the valley. Okay. It was a place called the New Theater. And um, and there was another guy in that class named Christopher Best, who was one of my not uh -huh, okay. one of my okay. dearest, I was like Christopher dearest Guest. friends. I was like, no. oh, okay. Chris Best, um, actor, comedian, second city guy. Um, and it was we were in an acting class together and we just hit it off. We were not particularly successful in the acting class, but we had a hell of a lot of fun together and we laughed a lot. And he said to me, um, you should meet my roommate, which was Mary. Oh, wow. And, um, and I'll never forget that Mary t always told this story, which was Chris and I were rehearsing a scene. He purposely was late so that I would go there and have time to spend with Mary. And he called Mary and said, Mary, uh, this, the guy I told you about, uh, my scene partner's coming over. And he, she had been, he had been telling her about me. It's coming over, and Mary was. It was right around Christmas time. She was doing one of the things, her favorite things in life, which was decorating her Christmas tree. Oh wow! And she said, "Oh, Chris, for God's sakes, I'm doing my. Why do? I don't know. <laughs> you say he's so great. You know, uh, if he's so great, why doesn't he have a girlfriend?" <laughs> or you know, she said something like that. And then she opened the door, she said, with all this attitude, and saw me and went, hi. <laughs> and uh, the rest was history. Wow. And that same Christmas, she's, he was going back to Philadelphia, and she, she said to him, you have to meet my friend Nancy that I grew up with. She's in Philadelphia. So they set each other up with their respective spouses. No way. And their boys are two of my godsons that I referred to earlier. So wow. they're still very close 
Um, I'm very close with them. And of all the weirdest things, they have moved to Portland. Oh, um, wow. So they're up where, from yeah. where you grew up, yeah, your I area. Just, I just came back from visiting them. So I love their boys. I've been in their lives. They've been in my life. Her, this, I'll tell you one story. It may be a little out of whack, but the two boys. Sure. They were a, away on a camping trip when Mary passed away. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and Chris and Nancy went to the airport a day or so afterwards and picked them up. And they hadn't told them what had happened. They were very close to Mary. And when Nancy, the uh, Mary's friend and, and Chris's wife, their mother, uh, when they got off the plane, she was crying. And they and they were said, "Oh, mom, come on! It hasn't been that long." And she mm-hmm. said, "No, you don't understand. Um, we want to tell you what happened. Mary passed away." And they said to them, "Well, what do you want to do?" They said, "Well, I want to go up and see Ken." Those boys came to my house that afternoon, right off the plane. And they never left my side for seven days. Wow. Everybody else, when I had those boys stayed with me. And finally, I said to them, guys, it's been a week. You know, there's got, you, you don't have to hang out here. There's got to be something you want to do. I said, well, we'd like to go surfing. I said, go surfing. Get out of here. Go. They said, okay. But we'll be back right afterwards. <laughs> and they came back. So they, they, were, they were a huge part of um, really helping me. And really comforting me. They really got it. So that's how I met Mary. Mary was a, she was, she had really stopped, just stopped performing, mostly comedy, a lot of improv. She was writing sketch comedy. She was, uh, had decided she was going to be a writer, not a performer. Mm. She wrote a lot of, uh, she was really trying to break into the sitcom world. She didn't. She got very close, but it didn't ever quite happen. She and her writing partner at the time, interviewed for Saturday Night Live. They went back. I think they interviewed with Al Frank, Franken and David, I think, where they had writers at the time. And I remember they had an interview with them, and that didn't happen. And then she started writing plays, and she got known. She wrote some comedy. She wrote some sketch comedy. She actually got sort of known for that. And then she started writing straight plays, and it was her plays that really got her noticed. And so... We got together, and I would say the first five or six years, we were together probably three years, then we married, but the first five or six years we were together, we did a lot of theater. She directed me in plays. We, I produced plays that she did. I directed some of her plays. We, we, we just did theater nonstop. Wow. And, um, and yeah, we came up together sort of that way. You know, in How old theater. were you when you met? I was in my late 20s, so I was 27, something like that, you know, 20, 26, 27. And um, we, so we married, but we also very much were partners in the business. I wasn't writing at the time. I was sort of her dramaturg. I read oh, everything. Wow. I gave her notes. You know, um, she ran everything by me. And then she got a break in television, and I became sort of the guy that would help all of our writer friends. They would say, oh, Ken has good ideas. Give him your script. And so she got this break in television, and I said to her, well, I'm kind of interested maybe in doing this. And she said, well, Ken, if you want to be involved in this television show, you have to stop helping people, and you have to write a script yourself. And I said, well, maybe I will. And she said, well, do it. And I said, okay. And I went off, and I wrote a script for her show. Um, I gave it to her. She said, she read it. She came back to me. She said, Ken, this is really good. Wow. This is really the show. She said, but I I don't have any experience. What, how how do I, how do I say to Jeff Sagansky, who was running the network, this is uh, my husband and he's never really written anything. And I said, no, I get it. I get it. And then what happened was a couple of scripts that were written by this, she had a very small staff and she was running this, her first show. Uh, he didn't like them. They fell out. And he said to her, well, what else do you have? We're not going to do those two, Mary. Mm. Uh, she said, oh, I have this one. And she pulled my script out. He read it and said, who, who is this guy? This Ken Haynes? She said, well, actually, he's my husband. He said, why isn't he on your staff? He gets the show. Wow. And she said, oh, well, maybe he will be. And huh? That's how it wow, launched my career. Wow. Yeah. So we were very... Um, wow. 
Mm. You did it together. We did it together. You know, and I mean, we, it was it was sometimes you were helping one side, sometimes she right. was helping, and it just kind of organically happened together. And we had, you know, I mean, that's were, the impression I had of the two of you, it, but I didn't know that that was the backstory. It it, it, it really was. Um, we were very fortunate in that. There were times when my career would be going better and maybe her career wasn't, and we buoyed each other. Mm. I ended up, you know, before while she was struggling, then I landed on a soap opera mm. as an actor, and I, I was on this soap you were opera. A soap, you were an actor yeah, on a soap opera? Did you I didn't know, know that? that? Oh, no, I was on Bold and the Beautiful for many, many years. Are you? Um, wait, yes, what? Yes. How did I not know that? Uh, maybe, that feels maybe. insulting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, that seems insulting. Why didn't I write that at the beginning? Oh, I didn't know that you. I would. I guess maybe I didn't. Like talk I think about I was that. looking at your IMDb. It's not on your IMDb as an well, actor. There's two listings. There's an acting listing for me that somehow they the IMDb hasn't. It hasn't meshed. So we gotta call them. <laughs> met, we have to mesh these. They must be intermeshed. Right, right. So the acting is a separate. Ken, how many years one. were you on The Bold and the Beautiful? And who did you play? Because I guarantee some people are gonna know. I played Mike Guthrie. I was on for six or seven years. That's a long time. Yeah. Um, started as three days, became a contract role. Then I was a reoccurring role for a long time. And and I was. How many I, times did you die? Oh, I I only. I never died. Okay. I actually even came back to the show in 2010. They had called me twice. They, they didn't really know what I was doing. I left the show in probably 98, something like that. And by 99, I was writing. By 2000, I was producing and I was really into it. I would say in about 2005 or six, they called me and said, Ken, we've written you back into the show. Great contract, come back. And I and the cast director called me and I said, oh, they actually found me on set in Toronto. And I said, guys, I'm not really doing that anymore. I'm, I write and I produce television and, you know, and I said, I can't do it. And I, long story short, I turned them down. Mm. Um, and then in about 2010, they came back and said, listen, would you be interested in coming back? And I was in between shows as a writer and producer. And I remember calling my agents and said, I think I get this opportunity. What do you think? And they said, yeah, if you're if you're out by September 1st or something, I can't remember exactly what it was, it'd be great. And it'll be fun for us to talk about it, they said. So I went back for three or four weeks and... Um, and I, I uh, you know, you caused some havoc in the I bold and beautiful. The, I was always, I was the troublemaker, and oh. I played opposite a character, played named Sheila, who back in the day was sort of daytime TV's biggest villain. Oh. Uh, Kimberly Brown played her, and so we had. So this, you were like the one B to her one A. That's right. Okay. And I was in love with her, and she was always just stringing me along, oh. and I would do anything she wanted. Oh, so we got God, into all kinds this. of craziness. All kinds Ken, of things. Ken, I can't believe how many <laughs> things. There are so many doors to Ken Haynes. This is insane, that. man. I, it's funny. I would have, I thought that you knew that. I, 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 I mean, I probably was told it at one point, but I clearly Maybe. had forgotten. But uh, man. Okay. So, anyway, so that was part of this really important time where that kept you two afloat while Mary tried to figure out her <clears> next thing. That's exactly right. And in the mid to late 90s, she was really gaining some speed as a playwright. And that got her noticed, and she sold one of her plays. They plays got produced and published, and she sold one to, I think, Hallmark, and she wrote the movie. And wow. then Jeff Sagansky, who had run CBS, found her and uh, loved her and really became a mentor to her and opened doors for her and then became a mentor to me. He really opened doors for me, and I stayed. It was a small... Um, family network called the PAX Network uh, that I ended up staying with for five or six years and wow. did a bunch of different shows. I did a show called Doc, like I said, with Billy Ray Cyrus. I did a show called Sue Thomas FBI. And um, and I ended up then, and then Mary and I together after that, we, we sort of went our separate ways then in terms of writing. She was doing stuff here. I was doing a lot of stuff in Canada. And then we sort of started to kind of find our way back to working together on a few things. We sold several pilots to Jeff Sagansky and um, 
and did some stuff, and then I went off again. And then we had the writer strike in 2008. Mm, I and, remember that. Yeah, and then she I said to me after 2008, she said, why don't you stop going to Canada and let's throw in and let's write some stuff together. We'd never written anything together. We'd been in each other's work. And so we started writing. We The first thing that we wrote together was Eden. Wow. And okay, so it. this is great. When is she diagnosed? <clears throat> wow. Okay, so this is... this. This, um, you're kind of in the middle of this, right? This is where mm. this is where I entering into Eden is yes. the time. I didn't, there, one, you know, you'll tell the story, but there's kind of an extraordinary twist from my perspective to it. There is. So she had been sort of having stomach issues on and off for I would say a year, maybe two years in the bigger kind of picture, but not intense, but, but stuff. And she was going to doctors and they couldn't figure out, and did she have irritable bowel syndrome? Did she have this? And couldn't figure it out. And in the meantime, we had pitched a pilot, um, Eden and almost sold it and didn't. And our agents, and it was a hotel show. And our agent at the time said, no, don't stop. Nobody wants a hotel show. We said, but this is really different. No, it's not really different. It's just don't let's find something else. And I remember I said to Mary, screw it let's write it and she said yeah good i'm in let's write it so we wrote it as a spec the minute we wrote it they were all over it we it literally went out to two places we went to jerry weintraub and we went to usa at the same time and we told weintraub that it, the agents had sent it to usa so if something happened usa bought it and we were off to the races mm. and then we started you know we went into development with it and we changed it significantly and um, developed it. And then on the day we turned the pilot in, she had been going to several doctors and she said to me, you don't need to go with me to this. This is my general practitioner. She said, go through the pilot one more time and we got to turn it in this afternoon. Go through it and then email it off. I'm going to go to the doctor and I'll see you when I get back. I said, okay. I stayed home. Just, just went through it quickly, you know, that afternoon, sent the pilot off and not a half hour after having sent it, I got a call from her and she said, um, something's wrong. And I said, what do you mean something's wrong? She said, I don't know. They're treating me really weird and um, they want you to come down here. Oh, no. And I said, okay. And, um, I, I, and I said to her, have they talked to you? And they said, no, they want you here. And I said, okay, I'll be there. And it wasn't far, 15, 20 minute drive. I jumped in the car. I drove down there, got there went into the, the exam room where she was, and she was already crying. And they had told her right before I got there, because she finally said, what the hell's going on? Mm. And that they had done a ca uh, uh, ultrasound. Yes, right. And um, they saw what they were pretty sure was late-stage ovarian cancer. And so, wow. you know, our world was rocked. And we... And then, of course, this thing that was front and center in our life, which was Eden, which we were thrilled to be working together. We were thrilled that we were sold it. We really thought this thing had a chance. All of a sudden, that didn't really mean a whole lot to us. Wow. Um, so long story short, we didn't tell anybody that she was sick. I mean, a couple of close friends, because we didn't want it to affect our deal. Right. And we firmly believed she was going to beat this. Right. She had a enormous, hellacious surgery, was in intensive care for seven days, came out, started chemotherapy, got stronger and stronger, numbers were getting better and better. And about the time she was uh, about to go in, uh, about to finish chemotherapy, the project got greenlit. So during that time, we'd continued to work a little bit on it, but it got greenlit. I went to New York to start to prep. A week or so later, she joined me in New York. Um... And that wasn't long after that that you got there. Right. And um, she was feeling great. And here she was, you know, no one really knew. Um, she had a wig on. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's amazing. But I, of course I never knew. Yeah. Why would I know? No. You know, and I mean, that entire time, you know, I, and she had a wonderful energy. I mean, she was obviously such a wonderful, bright energy. And... Uh, and, you know, we shot the whole thing. Well, and, you know, um, now I'll get emotional. Huh. She loved you. Yeah. 
That's sweet. I remember a story that I don't know if I've told you this or not before, but um, when we were in the casting process, you know, we very early on saw you, saw Enver. There was no question. Those were our guys. And um, and as it's always the case in networks, they go, they second guess you. Maybe it could be this one. Maybe, well, we really like this one. And I remember, um, I remember uh, a discussion where someone said, how bad do you want them? How, how bad do you want Nick? And she talked to me briefly, and and then she just turned and said, "We bet the whole series on him." Wow! And um, she said, "That's who we want. That's that that is who we have to have for this." And you were it, and you were you know, and um, and that was a great. It was a great time for us because we were in New York. She was she she, she had family in and around the city. We were doing something together with both of our names on it, which we'd never done before, um, even though we'd been in each other's business. It was the excitement of shooting that show in New York and her family coming to visit, and she adored you and, and Ver, and we just had a just such a great time. And by the end of that, I'm pretty sure when we wrapped... And I don't know, we we went all out and had a drink at some bar or something. I think we closed down some bar late at night in Midtown when mm -hmm. we were done. And um, it was the next day or so, we were walking in Central Park, and she got the latest call from her doctor, and her numbers had gone down to, like, zero. Wow. And I remember turning to her and saying, oh, my God, I can breathe again. Wow. And because um, it had been probably been been close to a year and I just felt like we got this pilot done and we were loving it we were in New York we were with family her numbers it's like right it all seemed that it, it was gonna, all it was back yeah, you know felt, um, folded together yeah and um and then we you know we continued on and then as you know the the pilot ultimately didn't go to series for I remember a, how like I remember that the ex you were i think probably the first time in my career i was close t i was close to the people that yeah. were uh the producers and writers on it and you were open rel i mean i think pretty open as yeah. open as you could be as as i remember it maybe there were certain things you knew that you didn't tell me but you were pretty open like you know this you know this was feeling really good it goes from feeling great to not and well it went i mean it really went we we were we were we were looking for offices. We right. were interviewing a writing staff. We were being told by the executives it was a great pilot. And then it just, I, you know, it was the Comcast NBC deal. I, I don't know exactly yeah, what right, happened. Right. I don't know the interns, but it just went away in a day. And it was devastating. But within, and I remember, I remember right where we were when we heard it, and we went out to we went to the smokehouse oh, of wow. all play. We were meeting dear friends, and we were kind of stunned, and it was like, how could this happen? I mean, um, and it was shortly after that her numbers jumped back up and Un started to go up. Fucking real. So I went from this being is just like yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm, I could keep well, going. I was just depressed about the show, and then. It was like, wait a minute, life. Let, let's let's get back to what's important. So it it buffered our disappointment. Um, yeah, right. Well, there's you know, I mean, not to make I'm not making light, but I, I you know, it's like my father used to say, you know, if you want your legs to stop hurting, like I'll punch you in the shoulder <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's yes. like you were you yes. were. You know, it's not like uh, we should celebrate that lo the loss of that. Um, that depression on that side with the pain that came from seeing your wife's numbers go back up again. How soon? I, I, I don't remember how. Well, so she, she, her numbers the, started the, the, to creep the up. Now. She went back then for more chemo. Uh, we went out on another job. We uh, met a lovely woman named Holly Sorensen who had created Make It or Break It. And um, we had met her. She wanted to hire us. We said yes. Then the numbers went up more. And so the first, we, we did one week in the writer's room with her. She needed someone to help her run the show. And um, 
the numbers went up and we said, we need to talk to you. We went into our office and we said, look, um, we want to tell you what's going on. We just found out about this and it's early and you can, you, you can find someone else if you want, but Mary's numbers have gone up. She's going to have to go back to chemo. Um, we, we just sort of came clean. We didn't want to, we, we didn't want to put her in a bind. And so we told her our story and she said, well, what do you guys want to do? And before I could say anything, Mary said, well, I want to work, but you know, we understand it could be difficult for you. She says, I want you. No, that's great. You know, and, um, and so it, we did that show for a season and, um, Holly had some tragedy in her life with her sister and had to go off. And she said, I'm leaving it with you here. I thought I was doing you a favor. Now you're going to do me a favor. And so while she was gone, we took over and, um, we just had a great time in the show. And, Mary, uh, in true Mary fashion, she said, I will have to go to chemo every Friday. And Holly said, no problem. You take Friday off. And she said, no, 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 no. I, I'll go at 9. I'll be done at 11. Ken will, Ken will be here at 10, and I'll be here by noon. And she said, you don't have to come in. Mary said, no, I'll be here. And so she continued to do chemo. We continued to work. Um, that show came to an end. Her numbers continued to get worse. We kept trying different things. They kept trying different kinds of chemo. Uh, and then we were up for other shows, and we went on an interview, and it. I think we would have gotten this show. The network was very interested in us to help this woman who had um, didn't have much experience running a show. And Mary said to me, I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, oh. She goes, I, I'm done. And I said, okay. And she said, I don't want you to do it either. And I said, oh, okay. All right. She said, Ken, just stay home, write a pilot, stay with me. And I said, absolutely. We turned down the show, and that was about six months before she passed away. So I she don't just know. Yeah, she she knew she she knew something. And um, she continued to she was doing chemo literally two days before she passed away. So she never stopped fighting and but we went through the last six months was difficult because she, the effects of the chemo and the effects of the surgery and it was it was tough for her. Um, but you know we were together. She was hmm. she was in her home. Her family had come out and visited her, um, and she was getting more and more sick and she was deteriorating and um, she got new um, uh, pain meds that were very, uh, very powerful narcotics. And I remember that I gave her this new pain med that I had to go to a special pharmacy to even get. And I could tell it really looped her, you know, and she was, she said, okay. And then she, she said to me, um, and I want my anti-anxiety medicine. And I said, uh, I knew how, what an effect that had on her. I said, I'm not sure you should have both of those. And she got very clear. She looked me right in the eye and said, Ken, I want that medication. Hmm. I said, okay. And not that she knew what was going on, but she wanted this kind of relief. And I, she went to bed that night. I, I kind of almost had to carry her into bed. She said, you know, all right, honey, I'll see you in the morning. And, and her father was there. And she said, Daddy, I love you. And he said, we'll see you in the morning. She went to sleep, and she never woke up. So, you oh know. Oh, my God. Kevin. Yeah. So I look, I, I mean, as tragic as that is, and it's tragic, It the one break, however, that she got was... She didn't deteriorate to a place of hospice and lingering, you know, because she would have, Mary was someone that was a fighter. She would have, you know, she, she, she didn't go in that long sort of journey of near death. She went to sleep telling her father that she loved him and telling me that she loved me and didn't wake up, you know. So um, Ken, it's, that was uh, the break she got. It's... Uh... You know, it's it's an emotional story. Uh, it's uh, so powerful. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I think when that all happened to me, uh, you know, from my perspective, when that mm -hmm. when that was yeah. happening, yeah. to me, the feeling I was so, I, 
I don't think I knew how young I was at the time to know. Like, again, I was in my 30s, maybe, but I don't think I understood. Right. And i hearing the story now in the same way that I still didn't understand. Um, I've told you that a, a dear, a dear, my teacher died around yes. the same time. Yes, I remember. And I think it's really, it's extraordinary how life, you know, whatever, it's this cliche of life teaches you how to, how to see what's real and what's meaningful and yeah you know you you told you tell this beautiful story about the hopes and dreams i mean you know the business our business is all hopes and dreams you know and yet at a certain point it shifts and yours is such a strange there's such a strange symbiosis between the hopes and the dreams and the reality of life happening in tandem you know you have these hopes and dreams that you two had been built, that you wrote this thing together. You have this story that you wrote together, that you slowly but surely folded your work life together. And then to have life at the same time bring such a tragic element in. And as a father now, like it's just slammed mm. into me too. And I hear your story in a new way than I, than I ever could have heard it when I was, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, you know? It's, I didn't experience it the same way 10 years ago. Yeah. I experienced so much after the fact, after she was gone, while she was struggling. I didn't cry much. We didn't have long talks. Mm. She told me one time, she said, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to leave you. Mm. And I really wanted to see the kids grow up. Goodness, and so beautiful. And we sad. cried. And but I but I didn't give in to that because it meant that I was always the one telling her, we're gonna make it, you're gonna make it, you're gonna beat this. We listen, there's this, there's that, we'll try this. I was juicing everything. I was, mm. you know, and so I would not give in to this she was not going to beat this. And I never did. I mean, I didn't, none of us expected her to pass away that night. Right. It, I mean, it, to the end, you're like managing her medication that's and right. you're trying to, you're trying to keep her from tipping over the edge. That's right. And, um, mm. and then when it did happen, uh, two things struck me that I, I will never forget. I remember she died in our bedroom. Um, and that room has floor to ceiling glass walls and it looks out over the valley. Mm. And I called her parents who were still in town and her sister and they came. And then our friends, the, our closest friends, Chris and Nancy and, and a, a, a few other people and they began to gather that morning. She was still there and um, a lot of crying. And, and I remember at a certain point standing sort of looking out with all these people and we've all been crying and Mary's the the ambulance hasn't come to take her and in the midst of all that I sort of step away and I'm looking out over the San Fernando Valley that morning at 8 a.m. or whatever it was and I was struck by the fact that everybody was just going to work mm. and life goes on and I thought wow they don't know how profound this is and there's a truck racing down the freeway in cars and it's you know traffic jam and I thought it just hit me life just goes on wow. you know and um and you know and it does it goes on it's and you have uh for me I have a much different perspective there were things I didn't know about Mary or didn't uh it's not that I didn't know. I didn't fully comprehend them. I don't think it was until she was gone that I realized, and I think it's what you described before, she was joyous. And I just, that it's, it's not like I didn't know that. It's just, that was just Mary. But she was joyous. Oh, yeah. She had joy in her. And when you say you were very involved in with us, I mean, that's largely in part to her, that she 
she really embraced you, but she more than embraced you. She wanted you as a partner in this. Mm. She never saw that there was difference between what she did and what you did. Mm. I think That's it's beautiful. I think we both felt that way because of where we came from. But you know, those kinds of things I realized after the fact, oh my God, she brought me all this joy and she brought all this love. And I guess I knew it. I just didn't I didn't contemplate it before, you know. She was not I, I, I thought for sure I was the one driving, I was the A type personality. I was driven. I was this, as you said, hustler. And I've I was sometimes on her. We you gotta work harder, we gotta do this. The minute she was gone, I thought, oh my God. I always thought I was in control. Mm. She was in control. She she was driving the bus from day one, and she was smart enough and gentle enough to know that she couldn't tell me that. Wow. You know? Wow. But it's like I went, oh, my God. I thought I was in control. She was, she's been in control this whole show, you know? Wow. So that was a profound thing. I was like, oh, what do I do now? You know? So wow. then you have to learn how to. And I would have, I would have told you, well... If you'd taken me as I was, oh yeah, well I'm the one that's kind of, I'm I'm in control of all this. Mm -mm. It was her. Wow. You know, she made a, um, she made a very beautiful life for both of us in, in in every way, and I'm, I am blessed and profoundly um, grateful to have had that. Oh Ken. Yeah. Whew. I'm a lucky guy. What an absolutely beautiful story to share. It's so sad. Thanks. It's tragic, but it's such a generous yeah. story, you know? It's such a generous story. She was a generous person. Um, I've never done this before, but yes. I am going to take a tiny break. Yes. And I want us to come back. I have never sure. taken three breaks, but okay. I want us to have one more Abs moment together. Absolutely. And I think we need to take a break. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We'll be right back. with Ken and I know that this is the show's running you know longer because you know sometimes stories just need to be told and it's kind of actually um it's so beautiful to be the one here presently getting to listen and um it's also very cool to get to be the one who runs the show so I get to decide <laughs> when it ends <laughs> but um hopefully you're still listening uh I wanted to give Ken a chance to just you know sort of have some final thoughts about spiritually maybe some of the things that he's taken with him from this experience or that have been illuminated to him and also to kind of go down even further down the road of, you know, he shared this beautiful thing that he learned about what Mary was to him. What else has he maybe learned? What have you learned, Ken, in the seven mm -hmm. and a half years since Mary's been gone? Well, I'll start with what I've learned. Um, I've learned how blessed I was to have her. I don't know that it comes along for everybody. Mm. Uh, I was really blessed. I cannot imagine what my life would have been without her. I miss her every day. I think I miss her as much. It it, it changes, but but it it I miss her. Mm. But I know I was blessed to have had her, and that she was such an extraordinary person. And I think <clears throat> one of the things it brings to me in terms of spirituality is again how fortunate I am in so many ways. I mean, I guess you could look at my life and say there's been some successes, there's been some tragedies. You know, it, it's been a mixed bag. But I've been fortunate. I have, I have, in, I, it's tragic that I lost her. I was blessed to have had her for 20 plus years, you know. Um, it profoundly changed my life, even when I didn't know it was changing it. Mm -hmm. And, I think one of the things I learned, Mary was, um, she liked to also call herself a recovering Catholic. Hmm. Um, 
she was not much on formal religion, um, having gone to Catholic schools and all that, but she had a goodness in her. And as I said to you before, a joy. And there is something about that to me, that goodness and that joy, especially that joy, that to me is godliness. Mm. I don't know how to describe it. I don't really know what it is. But to me, that's the part of us that is godly. Mm. And I recognized it more in her than I'm able to recognize it in myself. So although she would have told you she was not particularly religious, she um, lived her life in a very moral way. She had, she lived by rules. She was a rule follower. Mm -hmm. She didn't lie and, you know, she didn't break the rules. And, um, and, and, but I've always, especially in retrospect, I've always looked back and thought that thing that was so bright at the center of her, um, that fueled her professional career, fueled her as a comedian, as a writer, uh, um, that fueled when she walked into a room, whether it was friends or family, that she lit up that room. That's That, to me, was her godliness, her spiritual essence. Mm -hmm. And um, ha having seen that in someone else, I don't know if it's made m my faith stronger, but it's made me more aware that God is all around us, um, whatever it looks like, and I don't know what it looks like, but that it is around us and that that is the... That's the beauty of all of this, you know. It's what makes it all worth it, in a way. So I don't know if that answers it. But I that's, think it answers it. You know, absolutely, okay, beautifully, man. Ken, I am so thankful that you were here to share this. I um, am thankful for the beautiful things you gave me in this conversation. Oh. You know, I sh this conversation really shouldn't be <laughs> about me, but. You gave me some beautiful things in this conversation, thoughts from Mary in the past and affection from our past yeah. and things I just didn't really, how do you predict where a conversation like this will go? But thank you for sharing so openly and giving a real gift to people. I think certainly myself, I think other people will feel it because you've shared so beautifully and openly. And I... Um, we're going to talk more after I, after I turn this off. <laughs> well, you're welcome, and there's no one I would uh, rather share this with. Thanks, Ken. I'm, I love you, man. I love you, too. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.